Here we go. All right, welcome everyone. This is Angie Fife with ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability USA, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 100% Renewable Energy Cities and Regions Network webinar, uh, information sharing conversation that we're going to have today regarding local policy and financing instruments for renewable energy. I'm calling in from Denver, Colorado, and it's a pleasure to have folks on the phone with us today from Australia, from Canada, from the outer reaches of the U.S. in Hawaii, um, so welcome all. We're going to do just a quick round of introductions. As you can see, we have a number of experts on the call with us today. <laughs> and um, I thank my colleague Anna Marquez at the ICLE World Secretariat for putting these slides together. And I notice on her agenda is Q&A and debate, which given debates we've had in the U.S. lately, I think we would skip debate and we would just simply say conversation. How's that? Um, so we're going to move along very quickly. We want to Note that each city, of course, is unique and that the local policy and finance options available to cities do vary greatly depending on some local factors, subnational, state factors, national factors, and so forth. But we are going to dive into some great examples of where financing is available, policy instruments are available to accelerate the uptake of renewable energy at the local level and see how those might be transferable to the communities where you live. So we will look at the regulatory framework a bit, um, some of the options around um, what cities themselves can do through ordinances or local policies. And we have a lovely example today with Core Aspen, Aspen Core, on the phone with us to speak about the renewable energy mitigation program that has been quite successful in the Aspen, Colorado area and a nice combination of city action with a local nonprofit organization in charge of the implementation. A little bit about the 100% Renewable Energy Cities and Regions Network. ICLE, of course, is a network of local governments. We do work in countries all across the globe. We have 17 offices globally. We do participate in a number of international events. We have a couple of those coming up. One next week will be the Habitat 3 event in Quito. We will have a, an on-site event at Quito, October 18th. So for anyone listening in who might be in Quito, um, do please let us know that you'll be there and we'd love to have you join. We do have another uh, local policy and financing webinar scheduled for the 26th of October. For those, uh, CEST would be the Central European Summertime. Um, so depending on where you're at in the world, that might be the better time frame. Uh, for you to participate. And then we will be at COP22 in Marrakesh in Morocco in November. And we do have a couple of events around 100% renewable energy in, uh, in that venue. We do have ongoing calls and meetings with cities who participate. And uh, to participate in the 100% Renewable Energy Cities and Regions Network, which is a partnership, I should mention, between ICLE the Sierra Club globally and the Renewable Cities program out of Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. And we work together to support cities who have set an ambitious target around renewable energy, those that are striving to reach 100% renewable energy and who wish to engage in international collaboration and dialogue. So to learn more about the network, you can simply visit go100re.net or go to the ICLE website and see more information there. So I'm going to go ahead and stop here and hand the slides over to my colleague Mona Newton at Aspen Core. And so Mona, I have got your slides here and I will tee them up and uh, you just tell me when you are ready for me to to switch them and I'll go. 
Great. Thank you, Angie. It's really nice to be collaborating with you again. It's been a while. Yes. So the Community Office for Resource Efficiency is a nonprofit, and we've been around for 22 years and started in 1994. The city of Aspen and communities around started talking about climate change in the early 90s, late 80s, and have and started tackling it by developing our organization. Um, we're organized a little bit differently than a lot of nonprofits in that we have an inter-organizational agreement. And so our board is made up of elected officials, representatives from utilities, and one citizen member board. So in most nonprofits or NGOs, the board is probably a citizen group. This is, um, our board members are actually appointed by their councils and their county commissioners and the utilities as well. So a little bit differently organized. All right, we can talk about the mission. So core, our mission, we really work in partnership. We work in partnerships with our communities, our utilities, our counties, and we're, we really try to track what we're doing with our programs. Our, we have a number of energy efficiency and renewable energy programs, and we help those communities develop policies. So we have five member communities in a county, and then, as I mentioned, the utilities, and we work with them to nudge them along, push them along, <laughs> pull them along to adopt better building codes, adopt climate emissions reduction goals. We work with the utility um, when the organization was first founded and two of the original staff members developed one of the first wind power pioneering programs in the United States and also developed one of the first solar rebate programs in Colorado and probably in the US back in the 90s after some of the programs had gone away um, from the 80s. So we've, we've been a pretty progressive organization. I've only been with the organization for four years, so I feel fortunate to have stepped into such a well-established group here. I do want to say that the city of Aspen has a 100% renewable energy goal and actually reached that uh, last year. and. They set that goal again, working with the city um, in a while back. CORE has um, helped the city establish this goal of 100% renewable energy. The city of Aspen is a municipal utility, and they work with the Municipal Energy Association of Nebraska. And so their renewables come from a variety of sources, from wind, from some of it is from hydro, some of it is landfill gas, some of it is local solar. And then we have our local co-op, Holy Cross Energy, that also provides quite a bit of, of electricity in the area. And they have a goal, that co-op has set a goal of 30% renewables by 2025. And they are, on, actually by 2020, excuse me, and they are on track to achieve that. So we are now encouraging them to shoot for a 50% goal by 2030. So we'll see. I'm not sure what happened to the slides, but they're not on. Uh, so <laughs> My apologies. I, I apologize. Let me try this again. I thought that I wasn't showing your slides because I had my monitor plugged in. Um, apologies. Um, so Mona, we're going to yeah. go to your next one. Um, can you all see well, the slides now or no? I can't, but um, so anyway, I can tell you, so one of the programs, so CORE is a, as I mentioned, is a nonprofit. And with the, with most nonprofits, you try and find ways to self-sustain your funding or programs in general, as we all develop programs, we're always seeking funding from somebody for those programs. And in combination, Aspen, if you've ever been here or know of it, it's, it's a resort town. A lot of wealthy people live here and build large second, third homes. And, and the, the town and the county were struggling with the concept of how to 
do you limit do you, do you limit the size of homes? Do you limit the, the fact that they're putting snow melt in their driveways or year-round hot tubs or or pools? And we have a climate that's pretty cold and mountainous. We're at 7,900 feet in elevation. So they started talking to so Randy Udall and Joni Matranga, who is my formal former colleague, um, they developed a program called the, called the Renewable Energy Mitigation Program. Rather than say, telling builders in the building industry you can't build a house over X square feet or you can't put in snow melt because sometimes you actually need snow melt for safety in mountainous areas, they said we are going to develop this program and you have an option. You can either install solar on your house when you build it or you can pay into this fund. And so there's a couple of triggers that require you to, or subject you to RIMP. And that's if your house is over 5,000 square feet or 10,000 square feet, or if you install a larger hot tub than's allowed um, snow melt uh, on your driveway or a pool. And so with that, they can, they either pay a fee in lieu or they install the solar on their house. And, what, and the slide that, um, that shows when RAMP was launched, that's just snow melt on the roof. So in case you haven't seen that before in Maui, mm -hmm. but, but it's, it's actually an adaptable program to different climates, different areas. We just happen to set these limits based on snow. That's what we have to do. In some climates, it might be based on electricity consumption because of heat. The, the um, program was established in 2000, and since then we've collected about $12 million, which gives us about a million dollars to operate a year, some years a little less, some years a little more, because uh, the economy ebbs and flows. But this really helps us have established programs for energy efficiency, renewable energy, and gives us tools to work with our communities to help them meet their goals. Okay, next slide. <laughs> no? There we go. <laughs> Are you seeing it, Mona? You should see the rump yeah. slide now with the pie chart. Mm, I'm not, but... But anyway, so we were able to use those funds. When they developed the program in 2000, the promise was that we would double the energy that was eliminated from um, the energy that was, that was, we would double that for every kilowatt hour that was paid for into RAMP, we would double that energy reduction on our end with our programs and we would double the money. And last year we did an analysis because we were curious to see how well we were doing. We've actually, for every dollar that gets paid, we leverage it six times. And for every, we use um, KBTUs in our measurement, we've been able to eliminate about the same amount, about six kilobtus for everyone that gets paid into. So we're taking the money and we're really leveraging it because we leverage the dollars. All of our rebates and programs, we don't pay 100% of the project costs. We offer rebates, as I said, we have a grant program where we offer up to 50% of the cost of a solar system or an energy efficiency project for a public entities such as schools, public buildings, new technologies. We recently funded a very interesting water um, energy transfer system for a distillery. In most areas, distilleries and breweries are really becoming popular. And so, and they use a lot of energy, they use a lot of water. And we helped, we helped fund that project. And as a result, we're able to access data. And, we're, and they're more than happy to share the information that they've gained in developing this with other distilleries across the country and it's applicable it's applicable internationally as well as it's just within the state of Colorado so that's pretty exciting but as part of our study we also found out that people those who are subject to RIMP are actually doing what we wanted them to do not entirely 
but enough that we're making a difference with those also. So 43% of those who are subject to RIMP are mitigating 100% of their energy consumption, so all of the energy from their hot tub or their pool or their big home, and 75% are at least mitigating partially. So that's really good. And we feel that with RIMP, we've really been able to spur in efficient building design. We have uh, adopted the 2015 IECC International Energy Conservation Code and actually have, will be the county, Pitkin County where we live, will be adopting some amendments to that code and making it more stringent for those larger homes, the 5,000 and 10,000 square foot homes. This program, we're in a rural area, so it really supports a thriving solar industry. And again, it creates a revenue stream for our programs, which is really critical. In my years of doing this work, you need consistency in programming for, because people don't understand energy efficiency. They find it difficult, and they don't always understand it. So it's been a really good way to continue to help the community reach its goals. We haven't reached our goals yet. We're behind in, in the goals that we've set, the targets we've set, but uh, we know that energy efficiency needs to bigger, be a larger portion of the pie to help reach the goals. And you can see just where we use the funds, um, where our revenues come from. That's what the pie chart tells you is we used, we distributed $720,000 in in ramp funds last year, um, which is a lot of money in the valley. And if you take that and you multiply it times six, then you get this sense of what the scale can be for us. All right, next slide. Mm -hmm. And we've been, there's been other communities around the country and within the West that have adopted ramp. So you can just see those are some of the logos of the various communities that have adopted the Renewable Energy Mitigation Program. We're always happy. I just went to a small community in Colorado to talk about it. We're always happy to share as much information as possible to educate others about RAMP and how they could implement it and adopt it in their own communities. All right, next slide. Oops, that was it? I think, yeah. I think that might be it. <laughs> so if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them and I'm sure that will have my contact information where I can provide you any information you'd like. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mona. And apologies again about the little technical difficulty there. Appreciate you moving through anyway without the, the benefit of the slides. I also wanted to mention that um, Sarah on the call is joining us from Pittsburgh. And uh, so we hope that we'll be able to, to get her into the conversation. Um, if possible, but uh, let's go ahead before we move on to um, hear from Megan. Why don't we just uh, open up the, the floor to any questions about the REMP program, questions from Monica, uh, Ma, Mona, excuse me, about her program there in Aspen. Uh, any, any ideas how this might work in your community? Sure, this is uh, uh, Fred from Maui. Um, and and uh, thank you for the snow melt example. Uh, I actually uh, also have my home in Evergreen, Colorado, so I know uh, I know the snow pretty well. So um, the um, what I was wondering was uh, what do you have or what could you share that um, would show you know more specifically the amount of funds you know received, how they were used, um, the metrics, more metrics about the impact, um, sort of a, a you know, what else. You have like a more detailed, um, um, what's it, not presentation, but uh, you know more about the finances and how that works. What else should you be able to share? Sure, we have our annual report that might be uh, from 2015 that might give you an idea, give you a, that would give you a better, deeper picture of how we use the funds and and uh, yes, how they how they're used and. And, and if you are so interested, I mean, we do get Excel spreadsheets about where, you know, it about 50% of the funds come from within the county, 50% come from the city, and then at the residential and the commercial left level, it's about 50, 50%. Some years it's a little higher, some years it's a little lower. And so I'm a little bit about, you know, I guess the... Uh 
you know, this you were mentioning that um, I guess it comes through some sort of um, permitting process, or, or you know, that this uh, these requirements are are uh, imposed upon certain developments. A little bit more on that detail, because it'd be interesting to see, mm -hmm. you know, how that fits, you know, here on Maui and the other yes. islands. Thank you. Yes, thank you. It's part of the building code. A key, a key piece of information that I left out. It's part. Of, it's implemented as part of the building code. I'd be happy to send you the link. There's a spreadsheet, and it tells, and you can calculate it. You could play with it. Put in your fake home ad, your fake home, and and play with it and see how that works. And then, if you want sort of the back of the house calculations, I'm happy to share those too. Great. Thanks. Thanks for those questions, Fred. Any other thoughts um, from Micah or from Sarah about applicability in your community? Mona, what's the uh, what's the the perception of the program in the community? Um, obviously, it's been around for a long time, so so folks must like it. Do you feel like you get a lot of support? Um, from the community, um, any challenges you've had about the structure of the rep of the program? We haven't had any challenges, which is interesting. And I think it's partly it's the county attorney keeps things uh, a keen eye on what we're doing to make sure that the funds go towards carbon emissions offsets, not purchased offsets, but actually uh, carbon emissions reductions projects. Um, we do have builders, I think, that from time to time they kind of, wow, you know, they, they complain about it, they whine about it, but nobody's really put up a, a fight. Uh, they don't have issues with it. Um, so it's pretty well accepted, and I think most people realize that there's a lot of benefit to it. So we have really good public support from elected officials. and. And I think most architects and builders understand that what we've tried to do is make it really clear that these are dollars that they will see regardless. Unless a homeowner decides to do absolutely nothing. If the, if the, the idea of paying $100,000 or $20,000, whatever the amount might be, because they're building a larger home or they're building, uh, they're putting in snow melt, they rarely say, well, I'm not going to do it then. And so you either, the contractor will get extra work to install the solar system and install that uh, snow melt system or build a larger house, or the money will go into the fund and somebody will replace their boiler. Mm -hmm. So they still get paid to do the work. So I, I don't think they see it as a loss of business for themselves, and, and that's what I try to explain to other communities when they're considering it and the construction industry says, hey, it's going to hurt my business, it really doesn't because they're going to benefit most of the time one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Great. So good buy-in from the contractor and building mm -hmm. community as well. Mm -hmm. okay, good. Great. Well, well thanks. I have one yeah. question, if that's okay, Angie, too. This Please, is yeah. Is, you said uh, governments are eligible to, to tap into some of that funding as well, the local governments, or it's just homeowners that no, pay in and receive? It's homeowners and commercial business and governments. We have a grant program and this year actually out of $500,000 awarded almost three hundred dollars back to Pitkin County. They're building a new building and uh, they can make it better, more energy efficient with a better heating, ventilating, and air conditioning system. So they applied for to our grant program to which they're eligible. And we've awarded them some money to make that building more energy efficient, and then also install a solar system on a different building. Or part, and and again, this is all partial payment. But yes, they're all eligible. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Very cool. Great. Good. Thank you so much, Mona. And um, I will definitely share these slides with the group a little later in case you missed some of that as we were having some trouble there. So I'm going to now change presenters. And I am going to make um, Megan our presenter. So Megan, you should be able to see on your screen an invitation to become the presenter. 
And if you accept that, see, she's better, better technically than I was. So thank you, Megan. Please go ahead and introduce yourself and um, get started. All right, great. Thank you. Thanks, Angie. So my name is Megan Ward. Um, I'm calling in from Canberra in the Australian Capital Territory. Uh, do I need to remove this? Um... You're doing just fine. Now we can see everything just fine. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, so, um, from Canberra in the Australian Capital Territory, it's in the southeast of Australia. There's about 400,000 residents in Canberra. Uh, and so, we're in the unique position of being a local government as well as a state government, um, which in Australia is uh, unique. I guess, quick disclaimer though, um, our government's currently in caretaker uh, with an election this weekend. So I can only talk about existing policy, but uh, there's plenty of that to talk about to keep us busy. So um, we also host um, the National Australian Parliament here, which means that Canberra is really a, a town of uh, public servants and that's the main employment um, through the state and national government here, uh, which consequently means that Canberra is quite a wealthy and educated population, perhaps some of that has contributed to some of our success. So I'll talk about that um, through this as well. So the ACT has set some pretty ambitious targets for itself. Um, by 2020, we're targeting a 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions on 1990 levels. And we're primarily achieving this through our complementary 100% renewable electricity target. We've also set recently a 2050 zero net emissions target, which is um, you know, a key focus for us is making sure that we're leading along with the other similar states around the world. So investing in renewables, we started um, to really get serious about it in 2012 um, with our first solar auction. And from then we've held a number of auctions um, over the last few years. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the outcomes of those. And these auctions are delivering about 75% of our 100% target. There's also contributions from small and medium scale um, household solar, for example, as well as uh, voluntary purchases by householders and businesses of green power um, and a share of the national um, renewable energy target as well that can be attributed to Canberra homes and businesses. So the projects that we've supported over the last few years are actually distributed all across um, the national electricity market here in Australia, which you may have heard before as being one of or the biggest interconnected electricity network in the world. Um, it runs right from the north um, to the south and across to the west as well. So uh, where that little purple dot in here, that's Canberra. Uh, we've supported a number of solar farms there as well as wind farms distributed across the rest of the network. And we've done that because uh, we've been cognizant of the fact that it might make sense to invest lower cost um, electricity supply in wind elsewhere. Canberra isn't really suitable for wind, um, but we've also tried to support solar and we've supported that locally where solar is a better option. Uh, we've also, through this process, and I'll talk about that a bit as well, um, even though we're supporting wind farms um, in other parts of the country, uh, we're making sure that we're getting local investment benefits from those companies as well. And we're, we've got a big focus on growing Canberra as a renewable energy expert and exporter. So this is all supported um, by legislation and if uh, you're so inclined, I've put a link there um, to the legislation that you could check out later. And this provides the framework for the auctions that we've held for our wind and solar generators. Um, it sets a sort of high level uh, framework. And then under that, we, when we run an auction, we put out a much more detailed uh, request for proposals document, which outlines all the terms. So it, it runs really as a, a sort of a competitive tender uh, in the ultimately in the end. Cool. It also allows the Minister to provide direct grants 
uh, although to date it's mostly been um, through purely open competitive processes that we've allocated our renewable energy capacity. So the way uh, the pricing mechanism works um, that we've used and which is in Australia being quite novel is we offer a contract for difference. So that means that we offer a feed-in tariff price at a set point. Um, so in this example here we've got it at around $80 per megawatt hour which is uh, sort of in Australia mid-range mid for a wind um, feed-in tariff. And there you can see that it's compared against the spot price um, for electricity wherever that wind generator is. So this example is um, in another state in Victoria. Uh, so you've got in the early hours of the morning the local electricity price being lower than the fit price which means that we pay a top up. So we pay the generators that difference there. So um, it, it means that we're not actually paying $80 but we're paying whatever top up amount that that generator needs to get that guaranteed price. Uh, but in the morning when uh, everyone starts turning things on in homes and businesses, we are getting paid because the price is going above uh, $80. And this varies across the year and what it ends up looking like and there's obviously a lot of fluctuations in the market but this, this is a real day earlier this year. So in this case we would actually be getting paid um, rather than paying our generators. But why we've used this mechanism and what, why it's been successful is that it does guarantee a generator um, a, a set price and this is fixed for 20 years, the feed-in tariff. So it provides a lot of certainty to those businesses to be able to secure financial close with their banks and start construction and operation. So over the years, the number of auctions that we've run, uh, we've done a, a bit of a comparison of where the fit price has been tracking um, and you can see here that the price is coming down um, and it's also becoming a lot more competitive. You're getting uh, prices clustering uh, a lot more closely um, from the first auction that we held in, in 2014 for wind. We haven't um, got as good data for solar but we've definitely seen solar prices come down as well from the first auction that we held in 2012 and a more recent one in 2016 which was open to both wind and solar um, which was had saw wind and solar competing with each other and surprisingly for us solar uh, was quite competitive although ultimately it didn't win um, and we assess auctions based on a number of factors so but price was, was definitely one of them. Um, but our, so as I was talking about before our objectives in renewables are twofold as well as greenhouse gas emissions reductions and securing uh, a renewable energy supply. Uh, we're also interested in Canberra being a national energy innovation hub. So beyond uh, securing our 100% target um, which we've now locked in all those contracts um, so if everything is built uh, on, on time we will be 100% renewable in 2020. Um, but beyond that, we're establishing Canberra as uh, the expert in Australia and beyond uh, in renewables. So through our auction process, um, we've required bidders, especially those outside of Canberra, to demonstrate how they'll keep contributing to the renewable energy industry in Canberra. So that's seen a lot of businesses establish here, um, national and international companies, as well as a lot of uh, interesting research and development projects, um, as well as contributing to funding um, for projects uh, facilitated by government. So through this we've focused um, on research, collaboration, trades training and development, so having skills here to actually implement and deploy renewables um, in Canberra and outside of Canberra and supporting startups and businesses in this emerging clean tech area. So some of the local investment outcomes, so over $500 million Australian in local economic benefits. So we've, as I said, had some national and international companies relocate and set up here, set up trades training um, and a lot of use of local contractors even though those wind farms might not be in Canberra, uh, as well as support for tertiary research and education 
Importantly, we've also secured funding for um, a solar battery storage trial. Um, that's 25 million Australian in funding to support the rollout of distributed battery storage in more than 5,000 Canberra homes over the next four years. And we've started rolling that out um, in the last six to 12 months. And we've seen about 100 batteries installed so far, but uh, it's taking off quickly and it's, there's been a lot of interest from national and international companies um, through that process. We're also collecting a lot of data um, to be used by our researchers and businesses here uh, and to set up uh, and address some of the emerging um, questions that you have as you move to a higher penetration renewable network and how batteries can potentially help um, overcome some challenges. Um, you may have seen recently uh, in the media uh, one of the states, an entire state um, in Australia uh, experienced a blackout for about half a day um, and there's been questions around whether that's due to increasing renewable energy generation um, and I think ultimately everyone's saying it wasn't but uh, we definitely need to make sure that our network are resilient um, and battery storage uh, as well as other ancillary services can play a large part in that but there are a lot of questions to be answered um, as we increase the amount of renewables in our network in Australia. We've also uh, through this process um, had a number of companies come to us with hydrogen proposals so uh, whilst uh, we've had a big focus on batteries as well as uh, um, electric vehicle applications with batteries. We've also uh, secured funding to do some further research into hydrogen, um, deploying a number of hydrogen cars in Australia. There's really no hydrogen here in terms of vehicles at the moment. Um, so we'll be rolling out uh, the biggest, biggest rollout of hydrogen vehicle fleet um, in Australia in the coming years as well as some infrastructure around that. So we're very interested in an we see government's role as supporting you know, a wide range of, of technologies, undertaking early research um, and development, as well as supporting the deployment of already established technologies. Uh, so that's that's it. That's Canberra and our 100% renewable energy target. Um, happy to take questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Megan. And I can I can hear the wheels turning in, in Mona's head. She's saying, I'm going to visit Australia soon <laughs> and check this <laughs> out <laughs> uh, firsthand. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and it's wonderful to see the, the, the role that this policy and this type of financing has played in really accelerating the uptake of renewables there, as well as the co-benefits of bringing in new industry and giving you the opportunity to try some innovative things around hydrogen and battery storage. So good job. I'm very glad to hear about the, the work there and congratulations. So uh, let's open it up to our city participants. Any, any questions or um, comments about um, Canberra? I had one, Angie and uh, Megan, if that's okay, this is Paul. Please. What, what was uh, driving people's decision to go with storage systems? Gabby, yeah, so it's, yeah it's, it's an interesting one. Um, we weren't sure when we started um, the providing support for battery storage systems what the demand from a household level would be. Um, we've been quite honest in that it's not quite economic at the moment and that's why we've, uh, we're providing a, a grant for householders. And we actually run this in a similar, in a similar fashion to our large scale auctions where we actually open up a competitive process for um, businesses and stallers who want to roll these out in um, Canberra homes and businesses. So they bid in um, and then if they're successful they secure a fixed grant price that they're able to offer um, to a householder. Um, and we do that on a basis at the moment we're paying uh, $825 per uh, kilowatt of peak sustained output of the system um, because that's what we see as supporting um, our electricity network is the battery being able to respond um, in uh, fast, 
to any network events. Um, and so what's driving household uptake at the moment is that I think there's been a lot of influence of the successful Tesla uh, marketing factor. Uh, mm -hmm. That's definitely the most popular battery that's being rolled out under our program at the moment, even though there are a number of other alternatives available um, that might be cheaper. Uh, so that's very interesting and that'll be interesting for us to monitor as the program goes forward, um, whether that remains the case. Um, there are a lot of other interesting technologies coming coming online that, um, that we're supporting as well. Um, but uh, definitely seems to be the early, early adopters um, that uh, may have missed out on um, solar when we had some very generous feed-in tariffs for solar in the early days, they might be installing it now, getting getting this um, grant to install storage at the same time. Um, and it seems to be across Australia a general um, interest in people getting a bit more independence from from the grid. Um, all these households are still staying connected to the grid, um, but yeah, it, it's hard to say and it's hard to say whether that will continue um, to grow. We've definitely, there's enough interest to support the kind of um, amount of money that we're offering at the moment, but um, as those early adopters are, um, are exhausted, we'll see. And I think as well it comes back to, um, as I said in the beginning, Canberra is a, a government town where we're quite wealthy, educated, we're interested in technology, um, and so that's probably driving a lot of that take up as well. Mm -hmm. May I ask a question too? Please go ahead, Mona. Thanks. Um, so, what is the cost of these storage systems? I'm really curious. Is I think it's fantastic to hear that you're already offering it and you've got some uptake. And can you give me some idea about what the capacity and the cost is? Yeah. So, um, it yeah it depends on the technology, and so we're seeing that. Households, uh, as part of our program, where they're also required to install it, either retrofit it to existing solar or um, with new solar. Um, and so householders are seeing packages of around $12,000, um, which might include some solar as well as the battery. Um, depends if you go for the more premium package, it might be $15,000. Um, our grants, so being about $825 per kilowatt of peak sustained output. Um, so for the Tesla, the peak output is about 3.6 kilowatts. So that results in about a $3,000 reduction on that system for the household. So maybe bringing it down to below $10,000, uh, which means that households can get a payback um, over the, the kind of expected lifetime of that battery, but not necessarily an excellent return. So. Um, that's where it's at at the moment. We're sort of expecting those costs to come down and paybacks to improve. Um, but we're requiring that everyone delivering these systems um, does a sort of detailed uh, analysis of the expected savings for the household. Um, so householders going into it knowing um, what to expect. So it's definitely not just a cost benefit analysis that the household is doing. It's a range of factors around, you know, kind of green credentials and, um, you know, having something to talk about at the dinner table about the new Tesla on the wall. So, yes, that's, that's what we're seeing um, at the moment here. Great. This is awesome. Congratulations. I'm excited about that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's an, a really interesting one. We're hoping as well that, um, you know, we, we'll keep the program going over a number of years and we'll see, um, track how costs come down um, and, and target the grants where they're most needed. That's good. Perhaps we'll have to do a follow-up um, presentation in a, a couple of years and, and check back in and see how things are going and, and how things have progressed on the REMP program as well. So thank you for that. Um, we have just about 15 minutes left, and I know that that will not even come close to being enough time for us to hear from our final presenter um, today, who is Paul Schwab. I'm going to make you presenter, Paul. Um, and Paul has been with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Golden, Colorado for almost a decade now, hard to believe. 
and has a wealth of, of experiences and um, opportunities to present to us some work that's going on at Unrel around municipal financing for renewables. So thank you, Paul, for joining us. Yeah, no, thank you, Angie, and thanks everyone for listening. I'll try to make this pretty quick and keep this on schedule. Um, I So I was just going to talk about, at least in the U.S. context, what's really behind a lot of financing decisions for uh, municipalities for renewables. Mostly, I mean, this presentation will mostly be out regarding solar um, is where we've seen most municipal activity, but um, many similar concept, concepts for wind and other technologies. Um, so. There's a lot of words on this slide. I know these will be, and uh, if, Angie, let me know if you can't see my slides, but I'm assuming you can. Um, mm -hmm. um, so basically the U.S. has incentivized renewable energy projects through the tax code. And um, basically it, it's a very uh, valuable, economically valuable source of revenue for projects. Um, as a rule of thumb, generally we say it's somewhere around half of uh, the cost of the system or half the value that a renewable energy system provides is actually recovered through the tax code through things like tax credits and um, depreciation. And um, actually, so it does depend on what technology you're using, uh, what the type and, and the form of tax credit, but roughly speaking, that rule of thumb of about half the cost or the value um, is delivered. The rub, of course, is for municipalities and um, nonprofits and tribal entities is that they, they generally do not pay federal taxes, so they themselves cannot claim federal tax incentives, whether that's the tax credit or depreciation. So what we've really seen in the marketplace is um, financing structures that allow uh, municipalities or other nonprofits to benefit from the tax incentives while not necessarily being the owner of the project themselves. And at least not initially, there are ways in which um, these entities can um, structure the project to be owners down the road once um, typically the tax credits have been used up. So what we call this is a table and there's a lot of words on here too and um, I won't walk us through them all, but generally speaking there are like anything trade-offs um, between different mechanisms that um, municipalities versus uh, private corporations can use to finance uh, wind or solar projects. And um, we've categorized them here as in the columns as two different categories. One is what's called, and I'm sure everyone's familiar, the power purchase agreement or the third party ownership. This was popularized and probably the most famous example is uh, the solar city now uh, merging with Tesla uh, business model where um, a company comes in, a third party comes in to essentially utilize your rooftop system or, um, you know, it can be ground mounted, but utilize um, municipal property to host the system. And then the municipality simply purchases the, the electricity and they purchase it at a rate that would be lower than um, typically their, their utility rate. The other category on the right is the other sort of uh, world, which is probably the more traditional world of municipal finance, that is things like a simple cash purchase or a, uh, a type of bond, a bond issuance, um, just like a variety of other capital improvements that a municipality might pursue or um, also a lease structure is something that we see um, a little bit in, in particular for solar markets. Um, they have different trade-offs that um, are listed on the slide that um, we can talk about at another time, but really the main thing is what does the um, municipality, what is their goal in the project? Is it to not have to put up any money up front or is it, um, you know, they don't kind of want to forget about it, not have any maintenance responsibilities, in which case a third party ownership structure might be beneficial. Um, is it that they want to structure the payments so that it's, below current rates. So there's a, a host or, or a number of different um, considerations beyond really just the cost of um, deciding between the different forms of financing. Um, in terms of the cost, this is a report on that NREL has developed that compares different um, financing options, all 
just walk us through a couple of the charts really quickly on the bottom. Essentially, what it shows is that, um, and what we've really seen in the marketplace is um, kind of two different philosophies for developing projects uh, and financing projects by either residential or commercial or government. And that's really either a loan for a project or that PPA. And typically what we've seen in the marketplace is um, typically the the loans, even though they're sort of just kind of emerging in the marketplace, tend to offer the best economics. And that's what we see in the chart on the left, that um, essentially the, lo the shorter the interest period you can pay, the, l the lower the overall cost of the project. Um, but as you, um, a 20-year a PPA, a pur power purchase agreement, is typically structured so that it's under your current uh, electricity prices, but may not be as good of a overall economic deal as um, loan structures. And the reasons for that is simply financing costs. Um, loans typically offer lower financing rates than what we see through um, third-party finance mechanisms. So when you have lower carrying costs, lower interest rates, it results in a lower cost of the project overall. What we see on the chart on the right is a little confusing. But what the kind of um, issue with that is essentially most um, customers of renewable energy projects want their loan payments or their PPA payments to be at or below what they're paying their current electricity prices. Some entities would be willing to pay a premium if they know it was sort of a short-term premium, maybe for five years, and then the system's paid off. And so really um, just all this graph this is meant to show is that the longer that you can um, essentially finance the project over, the lower your monthly payments would be. Just as in a car payment or a house, if you make payments over a longer period, it makes your payment per month or per year um, a lower payment. Um, and, and where this resides for um, a municipality, the, the main thing to consider is um, whether the municipality wants um, the ownership rights at the at the um, sake of giving up the tax credits. So because the municipality does not pay income taxes, um, it is unable to claim the, the tax credits or the depreciation benefits. And so um, this sort of question of what is the, the, the intent of um, developing and procuring the renewable energy projects um, versus, um, you know, are there concessions that are willing to be made if it results in a lower price uh, for the municipality? So that's just um, really quickly why we've seen um, kind of a trend um, from PPAs to loans. Um, I just threw this up here. If um, we do a lot of work to help cities because they um, really do want to achieve that lower price of power um, to take advantage of the tax credits, they um, go the PPA route, and but often get um, hung up in the contractual details. So uh, one thing I just wanted to plug is that NREL has developed for um, the New York Power Authority uh, basically a primer on PPA contract terms. And we did uh, quite a bit of sampling of different uh, PPA contracts to understand you know, where the common um, uh, stumbling points are. And I'm running through, I know we're running out of time here, so I'm just going to go quickly. Um, the other way, the municipal finance route that we see quite a bit of is um, simply bonds, whether that's a, a general revenue bond or a project-specific bonds. And um, the, the benefit of going this bond route is the, um, the municipality can access its low cost of capital. Typically, they have much cheaper, uh, they can borrow at much cheaper rates than um, what a private entity could. And interest that they pay um, to borrow money is tax exempt, meaning um, a lender can lend at a, a lower rate and still get the same amount of money back because they're not paying interest on the, on the interest revenue they receive. So we see a lot of, or um, we have seen more, I should say, tax exempt um, lease options where a municipality will um, essentially enter into a lease agreement with a solar developer. Um, they can do this without going to the expense of issuing a bond and the, the time involved. Um, 
but they are losing that ITC and, and depreciation benefits that I was um, meaning to do so. And in the U.S., um, an interesting little caveat is that um, there are protections in there for municipalities where if money is, say, not appropriated through their annual budgeting process, that they do not have to pay um, this payment during that period. And so this allows it to be classified as um, not as a debt product, which um, is a lot for many municipalities is attractive because they have certain limits on how much debt they can take on. And the last thing kind of what we're seeing is um, various forms of public-private partnerships and um, some examples in the U.S. that that are really emerging. Um, one in particular is called Community Solar or um, Solar Gardens. And, and many of these try to um, combine benefits of both public and private. There's several different um, forms that this can take, but essentially tries to um, still recognize those value of the federal tax incentives, but um, is typically developed by a private owner and ultimately owned by a private owner. And um, we have a lot of different um, reasons that uh, community solar or solar gardens has been developed, um, but it does provide, um, tends to provide more access to, to people who don't have um, adequate roof space or um, our renters or a number of different reasons. So um, I will stop there with a few minutes to go before our um, end of the webinar. There's my contact information. I know that was really quick, but i um, happy to answer questions that might come up. Well, great. This is um, uh, Fred from Maui. And um, yeah, I was particularly interested in the uh, revenue bond you know, and to see how that might work, just to give you a quick background, of course, um, sure. on Maui, the uh, utility is uh, the Maui Electric Company. It's not a municipal organization. Um, it mm -hmm. is an investor-owned utility, as you likely may know. Um, but what I was looking to find out is, is there a way to, you know, uh, have sort of even the best of all, all worlds not um, with a revenue bond where instead of the utility, Dictating the plan that they want to go to and, and, and going to the PUC to uh, You know go for that because that's what's in their interest from an in, uh, investment standpoint I wanted to see if we could you know sort of uh, Undistort that model if you will um, and have a different entity perhaps the county um, Taking on revenue bonds to pay for infrastructure, but the utility um, you know uh, operates and maintains the facility um, but I see what you're saying here is that you know there's some benefit, some upside and some downside. One of the part of the downside would be, of course, the uh, you know the um, loss of the ITC and such. Um, and but the upside perhaps is the federal income tax exemptions. So I right. guess you the balance there though is given the size of the ITC, um, you. Uh, are likely better off still not using a revenue bond because of that loss, right? right. Well, you know, that's a good question, Fred. Um, I've, we've had some pretty um, uh, debates on this between some developers and what we've seen in the market. So it's not, I wouldn't say, a universally accepted statement that one is going to be economically more attractive. If you can get really low-cost financing, or have a some sort of program like the Aspen program that helps to offset some of that loss of the tax credit, then potentially it could be, um, you know, a, a closer scenario. The other thing is there have been some attempts. Um, New Jersey is a notable example where the municipality, through a public-private partnership, um, tried to both um, issue tax exempt debt and claim the tax credit. It didn't. Uh, it ran into some challenges, but I think the model itself was people thought workable and replicable. But the particulars of the uh, New Jersey case um, ran into challenges in terms of um, things like the S the rec prices weren't supportive at, as at the level that they thought they would be. So I would say if it's really of an interest that there are uh -oh. some um, information we could send to try and get the best of both worlds, but it, it does create quite a bit of complexity in the project, which 
And that's what people generally for the revenue bonds try to stay away from is sort of the, the highly complexity and the, the essentially the cost of setting all that up if there's an easier way to do that. Sure. In general, right, well, yeah, I'd love to talk to you more about it because it's yeah. just really interesting. And of course, then the second one being uh, community solar for for Hawaii. That's still going through a PUC process to be able to get that moving. Some people are estimating, you know, another 12 to 18 months. But um, um, you know, we're still hopeful that there is some opportunity there too. But we'll see because I think the the obstacle we're seeing is um, what is the credit. Uh, that, that um, let's say a participant, a subscriber, or an owner of the community solar project or community renewable project would get on their bill compared to the cost. Yeah. I think everybody's a little too used to or too accustomed to a net energy meter retail price. Right. It's not right. necessarily realistic long term. So. Yep. Yep. And hopefully there's that happy medium somewhere where they can still see some cost savings, but maybe not perhaps at that full net uh, retail net metering rate. Yeah. And we do have a model that can help calculate that that I will I'll say. Great, but well, um, yeah, I'll talk to you more about that too. And hopefully I'll be out back to Evergreen uh, for Christmas so I'll uh, maybe just stop by. Mm -hmm. so. That sounds great. Thanks, Fred. Wonderful. All right. Thank you all. Um, I, we, we can certainly conclude here if folks need to drop off. If there are any other uh, questions that we might be able to tackle um, somewhat quickly, we'll take those. And uh, thank you, Paul, for providing your contact information. I know that uh, NREL does have a uh, state and local government technical assistance program which local governments and state governments can apply to receive some one-on-one -on -one assistance from NREL. So I just want to mention that. Um, do you have instructions for folks who might be listening in who want to apply for the program? Yeah, thanks, Angie. I, I uh, should have mentioned that. But yeah, I think it's just an um, online form that I can send to either yourself or just someone could email me and we can, I think it's just a pretty basic online form that is filled out for State and technical local assistance. Mm -hmm. Great. And tribes so as well. You. Yep. US, yes. US um, Native American tribes. So great. So if you uh, would like to get more information about that, we'll, we'll post that along with the slides and the recording. I want to thank Mona from Aspen, uh, Megan from Australia for joining us, and Paul from the National Renewable Energy Lab, and to our attendees who listened in and participated today, as well as those who are listening online. Thank you again. We will have another session coming up on October 26th. So do check back if you're interested in participating in that. And uh, good evening, good morning, good day to all of you, wherever you're listening from. And thank you again so much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice thank you. to hear from all of you. Thanks. Great. Bye. Bye now. Bye.